The Orioles pitchers and catchers arrived at spring training on Wednesday. When the players get there, the news always starts to trickle out. And that is what happened. We had a player avoid arbitration. We had some massive news. And we had the Orioles add to their depth with another trade. And we'll get to it all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles. Your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Thursday, February 15th, 2024, and welcome back into the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we're going to talk about the addition the O's made to the 40-man roster on Wednesday, acquiring right-handed hitting outfielder Peyton Burdick in a minor trade with the Miami Marlins, chat through why the O's made this deal and what kind of role he could provide for the Orioles this season. Then we'll talk about Ryan O'Hearn, who avoided arbitration with the Orioles, being their final ARB-eligible guy who hadn't come to an agreement for 2024. And they also popped on a team option for 2025. We'll talk about what that means for O'Hearn and the Orioles roster. And finally, some great reporting from the Baltimore Sun and the Baltimore Banner over the last few days about Masson and everything surrounding it with the pending sale of the Orioles. We'll get further details on that. It's all coming up on this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. So we start today with Peyton Burdick, the newest kind of depth position player that the Orioles have brought in this off season, and really among guys who have got a spot on the forty man roster, which is what Burdick has. Burdick is the fourth of his kind, but is really the first true outfielder. The Orioles have already done this with Tyler Nevin and Levon Soto and Nick Maton over the past few weeks. Now add Burdick to the mix. And I figured the Orioles were going to have one more depth waiver wire type move at the very least coming up this offseason because Wednesday, when pitchers and catchers reported, was the first day that teams could place their long-term injured players on the 60-day injured list. Now, what does that do? Well, if you are on the 60-day IL, your roster spot does not count towards the 40-man roster. For the duration that you are on the 60-day IL, you're not on the 40-man. And because the Orioles know, they're most likely not going to have Felix Bautista for the entirety of this 2024 season. It was an easy move to, on that very first day, place Felix on the 60-day IL, and that is what they did. They came into Wednesday with a full 40-man. They put Felix on the IL, and all of a sudden, it opened up a spot. And now, would it be great to add another impact starting pitcher with that spot? Yes, of course it would. But it really makes no sense to go into spring training with any open spots on your 40-man roster. Now, yeah, you might need to, if you sign other guys, claim other guys, DFA someone else to open up a space. That is entirely a possible thing to happen. But while you're in spring training, you might as well maximize the amount of guys you put on the 40 man, fill up all of those spots, give as many guys chances to come in and prove to you that they are potentially worth an opening day roster spot, because you're not really looking to shuffle the roster during spring training. You can just mostly sit there with those 40 guys. And then once you get to opening day, then once you get to the time where you have to make those decisions, that's when you have to make some tough DFA decisions with the roster. But right here, no use in going into spring training with only 39 guys. Pick up a guy who you like. And I think that's what the O's did with Tyler Nevin and they did with Levon Soto and Nick Maton. They were like, hey, these guys are on waivers. They could be good depth for us. They could compete, maybe win an opening day spot, but more so likely they'll be really good to have in AAA if we need them. I see Peyton Burdick as a little bit different. Now, the Orioles get him in a trade, sending cash considerations over the Miami Marlins on Wednesday. And the way they got Burdick is the same way that they got Tyler Nevin and Nick Maton earlier this offseason. Those players were DFA'd and the Orioles, knowing that they are 29th on the waiver wire right now and aren't going to really get their choice of players like they used to get during the rebuild, they wanted to move up in the line. So instead of just waiting on them to potentially get to their spot, they just say, hey, Marlins, here's some cash. Let's turn this into a trade instead of a waiver claim. And the Marlins say, okay, they pull them off waivers, they make the trade, the Orioles send the cash, and the O's get Peyton Burdick, who was DFA'd by the Marlins earlier this week. 
Now, Burdick takes Bautista's 40-man roster spot. It is now full again. But who is Peyton Burdick? Well, he is a 26-year-old right-handed hitting outfielder who will be 27 this season. Actually, in 11 days, February 26th, he turns 27. And Burdick was the Marlins' third-round pick back in 2019. And the big part for Burdick being on this roster is he has not just one, but two minor league option years remaining, which means if the Orioles like him throughout camp, they don't necessarily have to DFA him. They can simply, if they like him, but maybe not enough to make the opening day roster, or there's still work to be done, which we'll talk about, and they want to do that work in the minor leagues, they can simply just option Burdick to AAA Norfolk before opening day and keep him on the 40-man, which is big for a team that is kind of having less and less players now as the team gets older that have these minor league options. So he's kind of a ripped guy, I will say. He's six foot 205. It's pretty much all muscle, and you'll see that when you watch him play. And he has been in the big league since 2022 with the Marlins, but last year really didn't get much of a shot. He only played in 14 games with the Marlins at the big league level in 2023, only got 37 total plate appearances, hit just 182, had a 65 WRC plus, only one homer. And in 37 plate appearances, he had 18 strikeouts. That is basically half of his plate appearances. He struck out and only three walks. But when he made contact with the baseball, it was a hard hit ball, which means 95 miles per hour or more off the bat in terms of exit velocity, 60% of the time. If you expand out a 60% hard hit rate across a full season, that's basically the top number in Major League Baseball. That's how good that is. But again, he didn't hit a lot of balls last year. Now, in AAA, that shows you a little bit more of who he is because he played a pretty full AAA season last year, just never could breakthrough with the Marlins in 2023, played 114 games and right about 500 plate appearances at the AAA level. And it didn't go amazing either. He hit just 219. The 327 on base percentage is, is pretty good for a 219 average and a 448 slugging. He certainly has power. Now, because the average was so low, it was still a 92 WRC plus, which means he was an 8% worse hitter than a league average AAA guy. But he did slug 24 homers in AAA last year. 12% walk rate, really good number. 37% strikeout rate. Once your strikeout rate gets over 30%, it starts to become very concerning. And Burdick is up close to 40%. Again, 37% strikeout rate in the major leagues last year would have been one of the five highest in baseball. Like, that's a little bit concerning. Here's the flip side of who Peyton Burdick is. Like, yes, he has some strikeout issues. Okay. Yes, he hasn't performed yet at the major league level. However, the underlying numbers, the batted ball data that he has shown, mostly at AAA, but also at the big league level when he's made contact with the baseball, has been pretty astounding. In AAA this year, Burdick had a 116.2 mile per hour max exit velocity. That means that is the hardest ball that he hit all season. Now, I know some people don't like to go with maximum exit velocity. They say, well, there can easily be outliers, right? Statistically, you shouldn't just go by the outlier. Some people like 95th percentile exit velocity. It kind of puts together, okay, you know, what's your very top hit? Let's take that one off and let's go kind of below that. Some people like average exit velocity, right? Like what's your average throughout the season? But there's a kind of a good saying, and you know, Sarah's talks about it over at The Athletic. If you can hit a ball that hard one time, you can do it again. So that's why I like max exit velocity as well. And 116.2, had he done that at the major league level this year, that would have been the 15th hardest hit ball in baseball this year. In all of major league baseball, would have been Peyton Burdick. Aaron Judge's hardest hit ball was 116.9, just a tick above what Peyton Burdick does. That's pretty impressive. That max exit velocity was also fifth in all of AAA baseball among hitters with at least 150 batted ball events. 91.4 mile per hour is his average exit velocity. That's the same as Ryan Mountcastle, who hits the ball incredibly hard. That would have been top 50 in MLB. 47% hard hit rate for Burdick in AAA last year. Again, would have been top 50 in MLB and would have been third on the Orioles last season. And his 12.7% barrel rate was equal to that of Rafael Devers last year. And I understand the guys I'm comparing him to are facing big league hitters. These are his stats against AAA pitchers. But a 12.7% barrel rate would have led the Orioles had he been with the O's and done it in the majors last season. So it's not a one-to-one -one comparison. It's a lower league. 
But when you can hit the ball hard, you can hit the ball hard. And he's done it at the big league level too. You know, even some of his max exit velocities are like 112, 113 at the big league level. The good thing for Burdick is that the issue with the strikeouts, again, 37% last year, that is way too high. The issue with the strikeouts is not a chasing issue. Now he does chase, right? And more than, you know, a guy like Adley Rutschman, kind of everybody does. But a 28% chase rate swings at 28% of the pitches that are outside the strike zone. In today's MLB, that's that's like fine. That's like you're not really worried about that number at all. So you're saying, okay, he's not really chasing balls. Why is he striking out so much? Well, he is really bad when it comes to swinging and missing at pitches in the zone. 28% is also his in-zone swing and miss rate. Had you put that in Major League Baseball this year, it would have been by far the worst in-zone swing and miss rate of any qualified hitter in the majors in 2023. That is concerning. What it tells me is he has a good batter's eye. He draws walks. He doesn't chase out of the zone. That is a huge thing to have. So what's the issue? There's something with his swing, whether it's a hitch, whether it's timing, where he just has a gaping hole in his swing. There are either types of pitches in the zone or just an area of the strike zone that he just can't get to with his current swing. Now, when he gets to balls with his swing, they go far. Again, 25 homers in 2023, crazy big exit velocities. He mashes the baseball. But there are spots, and big league pitchers know where they are, where he just can't get to it. So the question basically is for Peyton Burdick, can the Orioles identify what it is in the swing that the Marlins just weren't able to over the past few years and fix it enough that he can take 37% strikeouts down to 27% strikeouts? Because if he can do that, that is a legitimate big league player. That is the one thing that needs to be done. Fix that hole in that swing to get more contact. And, you know, he did debut in 2022. Bigger big league sample size that year, 32 games, 102 plate appearances. But again, 207 average, 84 WRC plus, 34% strikeout rate. Like it was the same issues in 22 when he made his big league debut. But there's been a lot of hype around this guy. The last time he was on a prospect list at Fangraphs was in the Marlins 2022 list. And he was ranked as their ninth best prospect in not an amazing system, but at least a, an okay system. 45 future value on the 20 to 80 scale. And he was given 70 raw power by Eric Longenhagen at Fangrass. Basically means, hey, in terms of just how strong and how hard and how far he can hit the ball, he was one of the best prospects in all of baseball at doing that. And he showed it after he was drafted. In the low minors in 2019 and then in double A in 2021, he was unbelievable. He was putting up like crazy stats, like hitting over 400, hitting homers left and right. And people were like amazed by what he could do. But then he continued into the high minors in 2022, got to AAA, and that's when the strikeouts started coming. He was still hitting okay enough to get to the big leagues, but the strikeouts continued as he started facing better pitching, and they pretty much identified that hole in the swing. And he hasn't even been total a league average hitter by WRC Plus in either the minors or the majors since that started happening in 2022. Now, defensively, I talked to RM Layton, who's been on this podcast many times before and does a great job covering prospects and covering the Marlins in the past. He told me that defensively, he's not like some crazy elite defensive outfielder, but he can play center field. He said he was solid out there, can hold his own certainly at all three outfield positions, which is big. And he has a really good arm and good speed on the base paths as well. So he has got the tools to be a really good big leaguer. He's got the tools. He's got the batted ball profile. They got to figure out the hole in that swing. They, they just absolutely have to. But he's had much more success against lefties in both the minors and the majors in his career. He's a right-handed hitter, so could be a platoon guy. And here's what I see with the Orioles. If the O's can get that swing fixed enough, where again, the 37% strikeout rate maybe just drops down to 27% and he becomes more playable and he hits more pitches in the strike zone. A small side platoon player with a struggling Cedric Mullins even, or with a Colton Kowser in the outfield at some point. Like he's got a whole bunch of team control left with minor league options. So he's still a nice guy to have in your system. And here's the thing. When you put him up against the other outfielders that the Orioles currently have 
fighting for opening day roster spots or even fighting for a solid role at any point in 2024. He is better right now at doing what Ryan McKenna is here to do. He's a better hitter overall. He has much higher batted ball quality. He's better hitting against lefties. And defensively, you probably would still take Ryan McKenna overall. He's probably a better center fielder. But the difference isn't big enough to not look at the fact that Burdick's just a better hitter. And guess what? Burdick has minor league options. McKenna is out of them. So I'm taking Burdick over McKenna. You look at how the Orioles outfield is situated with Mullins as a lefty, with Kerstad and Kowser trying to win a spot as lefties, with Sam Hilliard and Kyle Stowers in the mix as lefties. The O's really need a right-handed hitting center field option. That maybe puts Burdick over top of Hilliard. And I've been talking a lot about, and Mike Elias has mentioned it too, how Jorge Mateo is going to try and play more outfield, be a center field option. Burdick's probably a better outfielder than Mateo is at this point. And if he can hit lefties better than Mateo can, that gives him a leg up too. I'm not saying he's going to be on the opening day roster. It's going to be tough. I think the O's are going to want to do a lot of work with that swing that probably means he gets option to AAA to begin the season. But I think among those four depth guys they've brought in you know, recently, Nevin, Maton, Soto, and Burdick, my prediction would be Peyton Burdick, the Orioles have the highest upside for and could make the biggest impact on this team in 2024. And if the fixes can happen quick enough in just spring training, they did it last year with Ryan O'Hearn, he could have an inside track to maybe that final bench spot on the opening day roster because he checks those boxes of the right-handed hitting center fielder that the Orioles really needed to back up Cedric Mullins. But that's a look at Peyton Burdick. Again, I find him a little more interesting than those other infielders the O's have gotten over the last few weeks. But speaking of Ryan O'Hearn, a guy who the Orioles took from struggles on another team and just fixed him up. We talk about O'Hearn, who will be back in 2024, but with his new deal in arbitration, could even be back in 2025. And we'll tell you why coming up after this. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is where you want to buy your tickets because you shouldn't have to worry when you buy tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. Now, I've talked a lot about how I've bought Orioles tickets on Game Time, but just the other day, I bought some Maryland basketball tickets on Game Time, and it was super easy. The price was low. The fees were low. I got to see the view from my seat. It was just a perfect way to buy tickets to the game. So you can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On. That's L O C K E D O N for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So we're here on an Orioles news and notes episode. It is the kind of first workout for the Orioles coming up today with the pitchers and catchers reporting on Wednesday. But one of the guys who we did see some video on Twitter, I believe Eric Garfield had it on Twitter of Ryan O'Hearn is in camp already with the Orioles was taking some ground balls and he's a happy man because he finally avoided arbitration and came to an agreement with the Orioles for his salary number in 2024. Now, another reminder, when the teams announce these arbitration figures, it doesn't mean they signed him to a free agent deal. This player had already been tendered a contract. He was going to be on the Orioles in 2024, no matter what. The two sides just came to an agreement on what his contract figure will be. And there was a chance, it looked like, that the Orioles and O'Hearn were going to go to a trial here where a third party was going to come in, hear arguments from both sides, and decide who would win and what that salary number would be for 2024. But those are always bad. It's a lot of crossfire. It's better that they avoid arbitration. They come to an agreement themselves, and that's what they did. Ryan O'Hearn coming to the agreement. He will make $3.5 million playing for the Orioles in 2024. And the big thing with that is he was the last of the Orioles' 17 arbitration-eligible players this offseason to not have an agreement yet. And on the day pitchers and catchers report, he agrees, which means the O's have all of the arbitration wrapped up as they get to Sarasota, which is always, always a very good sign. Now, the cooler part about this Ryan O'Hearn deal is that 
he was going to be, or he was set to be a free agent after the 2024 season. This was going to be his final year of arbitration, and then he would hit the open market. But there is now a better chance that O'Hearn could be an Oriole beyond 2024. Now, I understand it is a crowded part of the roster. He is a left-handed hitting first baseman slash corner outfielder. That is where Heston Kerstan falls into this roster. You also have Ryan Mountcastle as a first baseman. And you have a guy like Samuel Basayo creeping up towards the big leagues. And even Kobe Mayo is kind of a corner infielder, corner outfielder kind of guy is coming along. And there's also Colton Kowser. You know, how much do they trust him in center? Or is he going to be more of a left-handed hitting corner outfielder? There are a lot of internal options there competing with Ryan O'Hearn. It's going to be tough for him to keep this job. But he has the upper hand with what he did last year. The Orioles bring him over from the Royals, some failed years in the big leagues, and they they fixed him. They completely fixed him. They put him up in better situations, but they also fixed something with the swing. O'Hearn fixed something mentally as well, and it just kind of worked out. 112 games for O'Hearn with the Orioles last year, 368 plate appearances. He hit 289 with a 322 on base and a 480 slugging, 14 homers, and a 118 WRC plus for Ryan O'Hearn. It was a fantastic year. Now, the Orioles mostly hid him against left-handers, which, to be honest with you, I don't think was super surprising. Now, it was harder to do when they didn't have Ryan Mountcastle when he was out with the vertigo, but if you only give him, I believe it was, yeah, 29 plate appearances O'Hearn had against a lefty last season out of his, out of his 368. That is how you make the most of a guy like that. And his 52% hard hit rate, 92 mile per hour average exit velocity. Those are some of the best figures in all of Major League Baseball last year. Like he smashed the baseball. And so the O's have basically said, you know what? If you can do that again, and there's still question marks about whether he can, right? It's a guy with five years of not doing that and then one year of doing it. It's tough to see which player will he be. But the O's have basically said, hey, if you can do this again, we'll guarantee you some money to come back in 2025. So on top of the arbitration agreement for the 3.5 million this season they have also added a team option to the end of his contract which means if the Orioles want to they can opt into that option and bring O'Hearn back for 7.5 million dollars for the 2025 season and again it could be tough depending on how Kerstad and Kowser and Basayo and Mayo and even Mountcastle all perform this season those are all going to be factors on whether or not the O's do this. And if O'Hearn comes out, and I don't see him regressing like all the way back to what he was in the later years with the Royals, but he certainly could take a step back. I mean, every single thing went right for Ryan O'Hearn last year. He could take a step back. And even if he's just like a league average hitter who plays okay defense, you can see the Orioles probably moving on from him after this season because guys like Kowser and Kerstad and others just have a higher ceiling and would have more years of control and just be cheaper for the Orioles, even though they wouldn't be under John Angelos anymore. But if O'Hearn comes back and repeats this year what he did last year, there's no harm in bringing him back. And if he repeats what he does, getting that kind of player for $7.5 million would be an absolute steal in 2025. Now, there are some incentives with playing time that could up it to as much as $8.5 million for that 2025 team option. But even at that is a great deal if you're getting this kind of production from Ryan O'Hearn. And we don't know if it's going to happen. Now, there is no buyout on the contract that the O's would have to pay. So if they don't want to bring him back, they don't see the fit, they just cut him loose and it's no cost. But if he's performing well again, seven, eight million dollars for this Ryan O'Hearn, that is a steal. And again, you, you don't have to commit five more years to him. You're just committing one more year and saying, you know what? Maybe Kerstad or Kowser didn't do what we wanted or Basayo's coming along a little slower than we thought. We could use one more year of this Ryan O'Hearn. This allows you to easily do it. They did kind of the same thing with Danny Coulomb earlier this year in the offseason, and they do it again with Ryan O'Hearn. Listen, I loved watching what O'Hearn did. He seems to be such an important part of this team, this clubhouse. It would make me very, very happy if there's a spot for him to have him back in 2025 as well, because that probably meant he did it again in 2024. But one more set of notes to get to on this episode, and it's going off the field. There's been a lot of off the field news with the Orioles this offseason, and it doesn't stop here, even though the players have reported to Sarasota. A lot of massive news coming out over the last few days, and we will get to it, tell you how it affects the O's, how it affects you to finish off the pod coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. 
Yes, football season is over, but the sports live on. You can get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 just if your bet wins. You can bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same-game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. So to finish things up in an Orioles news and notes episode here on a Thursday, wanted to talk about Masson because we got a lot of reporting about it over the past few days. Jacob Calvin Meyer had a story on Tuesday in the Baltimore Sun, and we had multiple stories from Daniel Allentuck and Andy Koska in the Baltimore Banner on Wednesday, all kind of circling around Masson. And the big reporting about Masson this offseason has been that Masson was included in the sale of the Orioles. John Angelo selling to David Rubenstein to be the controlling person of the O's. They are kind of seems like fast tracking that process to get him confirmed as the control person. But Masson was involved in that sale. And there's a lot of questions about the future of Masson. We'll start with the most recent reporting coming from Danielle Allentuck of the banner on Wednesday afternoon. She reported that Masson's contract with Comcast, which is also Xfinity, which a lot of people in the Baltimore area, a lot of people in Maryland in general, I know have Xfinity as their cable provider if they still have cable. Their deal with Masson expires at the end of the month of February. Now, there was reporting in the story from Danielle that she talked to a Xfinity executive who said they are currently in talks with Masson to try and extend that deal before it even hits its final day of February 29th. And that is all good news, but it's still annoying that we've gotten here two weeks until that deal expires, six weeks before the Major League Baseball season starts, and the biggest you know, big name cable provider, it seems like in the Baltimore area, doesn't have an agreement to continue showing the games of the up and Adam extremely line go up Major League Baseball team. That is annoying. Do I think they'll work out a deal? Yes, because there's going to be so much interest, even though Masson subscribers are down. That's mostly because cable subscribers across the board are down the last few years, just with the environment that we're in. But with the Orioles being on such an upward trajectory, more and more people want to watch. I think they're going to get this deal done. It's going to be worth it. But it does make you wonder, is it going to happen? Like, there's plenty of time to get it done, especially if they're already talking. It's just another annoying off-the-field thing for this Orioles team. And it feels like John Angelos letting the door hit us on his way out. Now, there was some better news. Andy Koska reporting this in the Baltimore Banner on Wednesday as well, that the entire Masson broadcast team will be back at least in 2024. And that's great news because Kevin Brown, when he's combined with either Ben McDonald or Jim Palmer, is just a treat in this broadcast team. And we know what happened with Kevin Brown last year being suspended for just stating a fact on the air and John Angelos pulling him off the air for two weeks for no apparent reason, just one of the craziest Orioles baseball sports stories even of 2023. But the other reporting in the article is that Kevin Brown's contract with Masson and the Orioles is up at the end of 2024, which means if the O's don't do anything here, he could become a broadcast free agent after this season. Now, obviously, in terms of David Rubenstein coming in and taking over the Orioles, I talked about this in an episode last week. Number one should be shell out some money for some players, get some extensions done, talk with Adley Rutschman first, then go to Gunner and Jackson and Grayson and Kyle Bradish and Start to lock these guys up. But if he's throwing around extension money, a much cheaper extension that would get a huge W for Rubenstein, get huge cheers, huge praise from the fan base, would be extending Kevin Brown's contract to be the lead play-by-play broadcaster for the Orioles on Masson. That would be a huge W if it were one of Rubenstein's first moves. And it'd be an easy W because it's much cheaper than extending a player. It's much easier probably to get that contract done. And you could do it early in your time once Rubenstein is approved and takes over as control person. It would just be such an easy thing for him to do it. We all love Kevin Brown. He's one of the best in the business. Rubenstein, Get it done when you can. We do not need him walking to another team. It seems like his career with the Orioles may have new life. Now with Angelos leaving, let's lock that in. And that kind of final piece of reporting, which was done by Jacob Calvin Meyer of The Sun on Tuesday and then expanded on by Daniel Allentuck of The Banner on Wednesday. And Daniel wrote a really good story about Masson. I definitely go read Daniel's story in The Banner on Wednesday, just about all of the, the current state of Masson. But 
Jacob Calvin Meyer had reported at first on Tuesday that Masson was planning to actually broadcast more spring training games this year than they had the last few years. They were only broadcasting four spring training games per year over the past few seasons. They will up it, according to Jacob's report, back to seven spring training games, which is what it was at pre-pandemic. And that's still not nearly as many as a lot of teams do, but at least seven is almost double four. Hey, they're giving us something more to watch of these spring training games, which is always nice to have baseball back on in February and March. But on the flip side of that, they're not sending the broadcast talent, the broadcasters, to Sarasota. No, whether it's Kevin Brown and Ben McDonald or Jeff Arnold or Melanie Newman or Jim Palmer or Brad Brock or whomever's in the booth, they're going to be calling the spring training games from the warehouse, from the studio in Baltimore. And I get it, right? It's not the regular season. It's just spring training. But you pick up on so much more stuff, especially in spring training with so much that goes on, all the roster moves, all the news, all the guys taking the field. You just, it's such a better broadcast when the guys are actually down there in Florida for the games and calling the games. And I get that it's tougher for a guy like Kevin Brown, who's doing all this college basketball and college softball at this point in his other schedule. It's probably easier for him to just be based in Baltimore to call spring training. But listen, spring training is what a lot of teams around baseball use to get younger broadcasters in there. So you can give more games to Jeff and more games to Brett Hollander, more games to Melanie on TV. And you can dip into even the minor leagues of the Orioles broadcasters, which is what a lot of teams do, and allow them to call some spring training games. That allows you to still have that real feel. The person there gives somebody a shot and have good broadcasts. It's just, it's cheap again by Masson, still controlled by John Angelos to make these decisions. And Daniel's article does a great job of going into how many costs they have cut over the past few years. Less production people, less broadcast people, just less people, producers, less people producing all this content in general. It's putting a strain on the people that currently work there. I know that's the case. And the product's just going to fall because all of that is happening. So please, David Rubenstein, you got to make a call here. Either overhaul it yourself or sell it to someone who will make it better. And please, 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 Maxson, a direct-to-consumer streaming product where an Orioles fan can pay 100 bucks, 150 bucks, and we can get the entire season of Masson games streamed to us no matter where we live. Just do it. So many other streaming networks do it. It's a great thing for the fans. Just get it done. Hopefully a lot of these Masson things will be resolved here shortly once Rubenstein does officially take over the team. But that'll do it for today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure to leave us a five-star rating and a review, if you can, wherever you listen. And like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked on Orioles YouTube page. Most likely back with one more episode this week. We'll probably get some more news and notes coming up here on Thursday because most likely with the first workout, you'll probably hear from Brandon Hyde, might even hear from Mike Elias. We'll get some full updates on what this roster looks like heading into spring, and we'll get them to you on tomorrow's episode to finish out the week. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.